Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Ilana. Um, this is a joint presentation with Shua from the Linux Foundation. Um, it arose out of work um, as part of uh, ELISA, which is a project which we are involved in for enabling Linux in safety critical systems. And in particularly um, recently, we've been focusing on the potential of um, RT Linux and the power um, for safety critical systems rather than as in the past, um, having to rely on uh, pr proprietary RTOSs. So I will be giving the first part of this talk. Shua will be continuing for the second half. She's been doing work on actually testing um, on real workloads and she'll present her work as well. Okay, and what's important is this is very much an early work. It's work in progress, um, trying to investigate the, the potential and the limitations, the challenges of um, having to comply with both safety requirements and real-time constraints and how to do that in, the, in a, an effective and um, appropriate way um, for safety critical systems. Um, about myself, I, I work at Mobileye and um, as a, a system uh, software safety architect and, um, and this has implications for our work, but also in general for the work in ELISA to, um, to bring awareness of um, RT Linux to the safety critical community and to foster communication um, so that the potential can be met and the challenges can be dealt with. So, one second, let me see. Oops. Okay. So, okay, I hope uh, it's... Okay, do you see my screen moving ahead, the, the slides, yeah? Yeah, it's okay? Are you okay with... Okay, I did not put on the camera because I, I, um, I tend to have problems with bandwidth with the video, so I apologize for that, but I will be in Prague from Wednesday and anybody who wants to meet up to follow up on different aspects of this talk, um, you know, reach out and we'll be glad to, to speak. Okay, so um, on the first part, I will be providing a brief overview of some features of RT Linux, which I have been starting to look into um, but with a, with a new point of view, with a focus of trying to understand um, how they can be used to support um, safety critical features and, and, and to deploy safety critical systems. Okay, and this is where, um, again, the feedback and the input is important because it's, it's, it's an analysis from a different angle and, um, and how, you know, we can best move ahead. Okay, so this is the first part of the talk. And what we're trying to achieve here is uh, an awareness of the existing and potential RT Linux features, which can be used to support the deployment um, of um, deployment in safety critical systems, generating the interest and communication and um, helping to actually develop and test such systems. Okay, um, what we are not dealing with here and that I wanna make it very clear, I'm not a safety expert. I'm not dealing with safety certification, qualification or anything like that. I'm talking about um, actual Linux features, um, which can be used to support safety requirements and real-time requirements. Okay, so from an engineering architecture point of view. Okay, what's not in scope? Um, it's, I, I think this should be clear to the people in, in this group that we'll be giving the same talk to uh, on Friday in the, there's a summit on, on safety critical software, Linux and safety, um, and um, 
I think it's important to understand the limitations. There's no silver bullets, there's no magic. Nobody is going to drop in any features and expect that they will meet all potential um, safety or real-time requirements. It's obvious that somebody, you know, everything will have to be specifically defined according to a specific use case. And as always, especially in any software deployment, but much more so even for real-time systems, testing is always a, is is always necessary to prove um, the compliance with the requirements. And um, when we what we are trying to do is to raise awareness of the features and to define guidelines which point out potential usages. But it is obvious that for any specific feature, different options will be relevant for different use cases. And it's always going to be the responsibility of the specific integrator, the specific architect, the specific user to, um, to demonstrate compliance for any given use case. Okay, so again, I think this is more obvious to the people who are involved in the actual development of RT Linux, but it's, it's, it's something which we have to make clear to the general public and the general audience who will be using um, or, or maybe relating to this material. Okay, so I'll go very briefly over some um, guidelines. And the real scope here is um, what we would like to be doing is to go to deep dive into with time into the different features and to provide more specific guidelines. So in general, there are, there are high level scheduling policy recommendations for RT user threads, um, schedule deadline has a specific use um, when you want to grant the highest user uh, controllable priority in the system. And then you can grant specific priorities and different levels for different um, threads or groups of threads. And then the question is, how do you decide when you are defining or architecting the system, what particular priority you define to specific types of threads? Um, for non-RT threads, we use schedule other. Uh, the default policy, but for RT threads, if we want to be able to um, comply with some um, strict um, real-time and safety requirements, how do we define the different, how do we assign the different priorities and to take this into account in the architecture of the system, meaning that we can group together those um, threads which should have again, as well-defined in the architecture, have higher priorities than others. Okay, so these are the kind of considerations that we can take into account when we d design a system um, which will use RT Linux. And, um, and these are features which exist and which can help us to support um, our, our safety architecture. Um, memory management, and again, these are the general rules and these are the types of requirements which we are, this is ongoing work, trying to understand how we evolve these into specific, more specific requirements for safety critical systems. Okay, it's, it's clear that memory allocations introduce latencies in general and um, it's, if possible, we try to limit allocations during um, initialization, which is sort of axiomatic, and um, to, to try to resolve symbols at, some, at, at system startup. And we can also, if, again, it's re whenever relevant, we can lock pages in memory after allocation. So these are features which RT Linux provides for us and can be used in appropriate ways. And again, we have to analyze the system which we are trying to use, and we can see um, in which cases um, the features um, are 
are most relevant and, and, and most supportive of what we are trying to develop, the system architecture that we're trying to develop. Okay, resource management, which is also a, a, a very fundamental architecture decision. We can define CPU sets, we can define, use them to support separation architecture, we can use them to define access permissions and to isolate CPUs dedicated to sensitive RT workloads. In, in safety architecture, there's uh, especially um, in the automotive domain in which, from which I come, there's a basic concept of freedom from interference, which basically means that we have to design the architecture so that um, software components, which should not be interfering with each other, we have some provable way of demonstrating um, that they will not and cannot uh, interfere with, with each other. And one of the tools which can be used, one of, one of the features which Linux provides, which can be used to support that, are CPU sets and uh, in general C groups, and what we and again, I'm raising here the same type of questions: how we can use these features to define the safety architecture to support FFI. Okay, so um, going back to what I said into 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 in the introduction, the real point of what I'm trying to bring here is introduce that RT Linux comes with a rich very, very rich set of features, which grew, which grew out of the underlying obvious Linux kernel and features which are specific to RT Linux. And the goal here is to foster this type of communication to understand how RT Linux is powerful and can actually help us to develop strong and, and demonstrate and um, provable or that we can verify that they are safe as well as uh, that they meet safety requirements as well as real-time requirements for real systems, okay? And, and, and to move away from the mindset which has always been in the past that for safety critical systems, we inevitably must use RTOSs which um, at the end of the day, will not have the same rich set of features um, um, that can be used to support um, more modern and complex um, systems which are developed for safety critical use. Okay, um, there, are there are different um, um, features which are, uh, there are different configuration settings which can be enabled, which are basically features of the kernel. Um, they can be enabled to allow, to give us um, some type of support for workloads for which there's a, a more strict requirement for jitter-free um, CPU execution. Okay, one of these is by, uh, one of these features is by enabling RCU no CB, CPU, which basically allows the kernel to offload the management of those of callbacks on for RCUs. Again, I'm, I'm assuming people here are more familiar this in this audience are familiar with the features, so I'm not going into the details of the features themselves. Um, but there's a balance here, and the balance here is that we have this overhead and um, Hello? Okay, another potential feature is RCU boost. Okay, RCU boost allows us to, to boost priorities. And again, there's a, a potential benefit and there's there's a lot of material which can be looked into for, for seeing the different backgrounds. One of the work, things which, and again, Shua will be talking about her work is testing, is doing, is testing on actual workloads. And again, what we would like to come to is some kind of more specific guidelines, generic guidelines for making such decisions and deciding if and when the features are relevant and what the benefit I get and what type of both real-time and safety requirements can be met by enabling the different features. 
Um, okay, there are a variety of, of features which are used for controlling the, the kernel timer ticks. Um, we can, um, um, from all kinds of different possible options, and um, which are, again, relevant for uh, multiple, uh, a wide variety of different use cases, okay? From one extreme is the periodic, where we, we keep the tick running periodically at a constant rate, even if we don't need it. And again, this is usually not recommended for modern kernels, but again, there may be instances and cases where this is relevant. Um, and um, to the, the no HD full option in which stops the timer tick whenever possible, okay? And again, these are general recommendations and what we're trying to do is to take this further and break it down into more specific um, guidelines um, focusing primarily on, again, on safety critical systems. Okay, um, system tuning, um, the TSC from Intel-based CPU systems uh, comes highly recommended and highly marketed. Um, it, it comes with its own cautions. And as a general rule, it's, it, it, it implies a certain dependency on Intel architecture. And again, the advantages versus the disadvantages um, have to be weighed, okay? Um, and we can do use F-Trace to, to, to help to choose the specified clock source. But in, in general, um, ensuring that we have a reliable Time source uh, is an important decision, and um, and ensuring that the 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 timer remains um, calibrated and accurate on any specific system. Okay, system tuning, power management. Okay, uh, there's recommendations. I you know recommendations which I um, not from which were you know from different sources, I gave the sources. Um, not all of these, um, again, everybody has to, to see what's relevant in specific use cases. Okay, um, Config CPU Freak allows you to change the clock speed on the fly and to save power, but um, it has its caveats, its warnings, and in general, power management for real-time real systems there's a recommendation that it should be disabled and, and at boot, but again, that comes at a price, and it may not be relevant in specific cases where power management is essential and cannot be disabled. So there are features which let you do that, for example, here for the Intel features, but again, um, you have to be careful when you test the system and before deploying the system that you have the necessary latency guarantees. Okay, as a general rule, and I think the last bullet is, is more like a, a axiomatic almost, um, that unused peripherals should in general be disabled because um, any overhead will, unnecessary overhead will impact performance. And again, this has to be carefully investigated and um, looked into. Okay. As a general rule, there are all kinds of built-in system safety nets which exist, okay? Um, if you want to remove any such, anything on this slide, and I think the next slide too, if I remember correctly, um, with caution, with a huge warning sign that anything has to be um, well tested, okay? You can disable RT throttling, and instead you say, we're going to take it on ourselves and rely on a watchdog. To, to manage uh, and unblock starved processes. But again, that means you take that responsibility and you have to demonstrate that you, you can actually manage that effectively and well. Okay, you can also enable the RT runtime greed schedule feature. And there's a new feature, which um, I only became aware of when I saw Shua's work and I'll leave her a little bit to speak about it later in her work about deadline schedule and deadline service, work from Daniel who just spoke before me. Okay, so there are many features which are possible, uh, which help you to, to either disable or to manage RT throttling. And 
as a general comment at the end, there are some instances where we just say, um, let a process starve until the load has somewhat subsided. And, and that may be legitimate even as a simple solution, again, in specific use cases where it can be demonstrated that that's the most simple and effective solution. So again, um, Linux provides us with this rich set of options and um, the awareness can help any system architecture, architect or any user to decide what is the most appropriate. Okay, other safety nets, which again, remove only with caution, um, disabling soft lockup and other lockup detectors. Okay, that's um, not normally recommended for safety critical systems, but again, with caution, if you can test sufficiently and demonstrate that there is no negative impact, then, you know, it's legitimate. Hardware errors, which are self-corrected by hardware, should be ignored, and that should be some guarantee that we get from the hardware vendors. And security mitigations, again, if you want to disable them, you can improve performance, but that's only good for production systems where most commonly, if you don't have um, high risk, high security risk external interfaces. And as always, after careful testing. Uh, memory safety nets, um, I'm getting close to the end of my time, so I'll try to be quick here. Um, avoid memory overcommit um, because it um, the kernel um, gets involved here to perhaps kill some process in order to um, meet the necessary uh, allocation and um, and it may not make the the allocation need and it may not make the correct decision which process should be killed because it, it may not have a sufficient understanding of the architecture and um, so it's something again, but this is a general warning, but again, if it's used correctly, it, it can be very, very effective and helpful. Okay, you should, can set priorities to control which processes will get killed or should never get killed. And it's always a good um, policy to define system reaction um, when out of memory, um, rather than leaving it to system defaults or for the kernel to decide. Okay, interrupts, I'm gonna go quickly over this. I'm not going to dwell on this because we don't have really time. Priority inversion is a very important issue. And um, it's something which um, we should support in the best way possible. And again, it's something which um, Linux has various multiple features, which can be able to, to help us to control, um, again, with no guarantees in a specific system. And But those features can be used um, in a judicious way to help um, control and manage priority inversion. Um, Debug tricks, I gave a couple of hints and some um, references here, but at the end of the day, um, the real recommendation here is to test, yes, yeah. Hello, I'm, somebody is saying something? Hello? We can hear you. Ah, okay, no, I thought continue. somebody is talking because I hear once in a while like something comes up as if somebody is trying to say something. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. And then there are a couple of recommendations for kernel configurations, but I think I'll, um, I'll leave them for afterwards. And again, it's only a sampling. There's, uh, as everybody knows, there's a long, long list of possible kernel configurations and recommendations and new ones. Um, being introduced all the time, which again, give us so much power and so much ability in RT Linux um, to do so much to support both real-time and uh, safety features that um, it's uh, truly amazing. And, and again, we, we would like to see more and more of this deployment in real safety critical systems. Okay, so Shua, I'll let you take it from here. Shua? 
Yeah, um, yes, Ilana, thank okay. you so much. Um, do you, uh, would it be easier I'm if I share? Stop sharing. No, I'm going to stop sharing and you can share your own. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think that'll be easier for you. Okay, so I hope you can all see my screen now. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. Great, man. Thank you, man. Um, okay. So yes, um, following up on uh, um, Ilana's uh, uh, talk about what would be the guidelines for a safety critical system, I'll share what I have done uh, in conjunction with uh, Ilana's work. Um, okay. Okay. It's, okay, so I took, my goal is to um, run a generic workload, which I, re, I primarily used um, RT test and RTLA um, to run um, experiments on uh, development branch, repo on the kernel.org. Uh, That's what I took, and then I simply enabled uh, preemption, uh, preempt RT kernel, and disabled RT group sked, um I think I might have run into issues with one of the RT uh, tests. Uh, quickly, just a rundown of my kernel configuration, what is different from the vanilla kernel. Let's get into what I have done um, as a quick rundown of uh, preempt RT versus vanilla kernels. I have run, uh, I picked a set of commands to look at. Um, cyclic test um, with uh, mlock all. So that's something we want to recommend to RT workloads, safety critical workloads, that it's good to lock all the memory that's necessary and allocate and lock at the beginning. And then a deadline test. Um, and then the idea is to run it on both preempt RT kernel and vanilla kernel and compare the results. And then I also ran a cyclic test uh, duration one to get a feel for how it's doing. And quickly, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of gathering all the uh, data at this point. Um, this is, these are my results um, from deadline test, uh, when I ran deadline test on preempt RT kernel. Some of the things that I paid attention to, I would like to get um, uh, feedback from this group on is there something else I can look at. One of the things I looked at is um, uh, pay, fail to perform tasks within runtime. Those That's the one I looked at in terms of because if you were to miss the deadline, that would be of interest to, um, to for a workload if we are um, missing the deadlines. So, and then I also play, paid attention to missed deadlines and um, uh, uh, over here uh, to look at how many deadlines are missed and so on, so that it, if that can be tuned. Let's keep going. Um, and then I have done this on vanilla kernels as well. Um, if there is any discrepancy, what I am expecting is that I would, um, at this time I'm, I'm just comparing data in terms of what I'm getting. Um, not too, getting not too, in, um, to evaluate more than that, because what I am trying to get to is what I can tell people to look at, at the, on the system as they are running the workload. So, and then cyclic deadline test, one hour, um, I have done that. And then on the, both on vanilla kernel and regular kernel to see how things are looking. This is kind of gathering my baseline, really. My main goal is doing all of this work is to uh, come up with a process and a guidelines for system integrators that are looking to um, use preempt RT kernels on their safety critical systems and to see how say preempt RT kernel would work together with their system as well as the workload they are using. So I, um, the guidelines for that is, 
the first thing is understanding the your system um i have uh, uh, measuring latency um in terms of i have used rtla system i'm not going to go into a lot of details about what i found on my system because that's not really important i'm just using a amd desktop but that that won't be the one that safety critical system integrators would use i will treat a system as something mm -hmm. i do not know details about and then same thing with the workload i do not know the details of the workload just giving guidelines on what uh, system integrators can do um uh and tools and methods they can use to gather data on their system to understand their system so guidelines on measuring operating system noise i have played with uh, os noise and os lat on my system and also hardware noise those are the guidelines saying hey measure uh, um, take your system and me measure your latency on your system measure operating system noise on on your system and measure hardware noise as well and using the tools that we have in the kernel and and then also uh, any outside tools that might be necessary i am made i primarily focused on rtla and rt tests as a means for um uh, to gather this information and then next step is understanding the workload um is the workload um what following guidelines in terms of um allocating and locking memory ahead of time so that you, uh, during run time you don't run into allocation stalls um and waits due to waiting for memory if it is a hybrid workload um that consists of rt and non rt threads um then uh, how are you um are, are the priorities are the workload tuned well to work together in a rt and non rt threads working together well the priorities of individual threads work together um the are the scenarios where rt threads wait for non rt thread to do something then you might not be able to achieve the rt goals um uh, deadline goals you are looking to achieve another thing i am recommending is that run continuous uh, hours of operation test on on the workload um to gather more information on how it's behaving over a pe longer periods of time as opposed to a a small snapshot um of a, a short duration of time how is how is it behaving so the second uh, while while you are understanding the system and workload um the uh, recommending that recording system stats before the workload starts to get a baseline on how workload the system is doing without a workload running and then also while workload runs as well as after workload stops take take a take a snap shot of all of the uh stats so let's see what um i am recommending here to gather information is memory stats is um Uh, some of the uh, ones are um fragmentation and vm stats vm stats and general health um interrupts this is all get coming from the um just looking at the system and the uh, kernel uh, what kernel is recording and then to see key users to see who is occupying um uh, taking up the time and then sketch stats as well and then rest all of the uh, looking at the different stats in terms of proc interrupts i think i already said proc interrupts earlier uh, pressure um what is the system pressure is looking like cpu io memory and so on um memory stats wise take the ext frag and look at that and then allocation stats in terms of what to look at uh, what kind of stalls we are seeing normal stalls um alloc stalls on devices and then compact stalls um if if a compaction uh, stalls or failures and then how many times compact daemon is waking up um and then also migration uh, if a um if um it, what kind of stats are we looking at in terms of mi migration are we looking at migration failures 
And then any of the, if uh, pages that are uh, marked for migration, are they, are we seeing um, failures on uh, actual migration happening? And then uh, also look at uh, MLOC, MLOC to, NR MLOC to see how many um, pages are locked. Um, ideally, uh, if an RT workload wants to get a good timing, probably it would lock more pages, allocate and lock more pages. Any questions at this time or any? Okay, I'll keep going. Pay attention to what I'm asking people to do is system integrators to do is pay attention to memory fragment fragmentation after workload runs. And then also uh, what kind of allocation stalls are they looking at? Um, compaction stalls, if they are seeing any, then they might have to go to look at how, what's happening on their system. And are there any page migration failures? Um, compare, uh, one thing to compare is migration success and failure stacks. Um, looking at uh, if uh, there are, uh, if number of pages, K compact D isolated for migration, are there any failures or any, um, anything to fail, anything failing there? Um, look for a page migrate fail of about less than 5% of compact isolated so that you are seeing, th there will be some failures, but they shouldn't be, you shouldn't see a huge spike of failures as your workload is running. Sig really the bottom line is that you should be seeing more uh, successes than failures, fewer failures and uh, more successes. And then how many times compact daemon woke up? It does wake up and you have to see, um, it actually tells you, if you see the number of uh, count going up, it tells you that compact daemon is healthy. And if you are seeing um, the counts not incrementing, that probably uh, indication that maybe compact daemon is um, not healthy on your system. Um, as I mentioned before, what we are looking for with uh, memory locked pages is we are looking for um, a, a substantial number of uh, M lock pages, um, higher number depending on the workload size. Um, since system integrators would know their workload, they would know uh, relatively how much, um, how many uh, pages they should potentially see. So kind of look at it and see if it lines up, MR uh, and M lock lines up and our MLOC lines up with their expectations. So I have done a cyclic deadline test with the six kernel compiles, and then I quickly took a look at um, compact, um, the, my stats, the stats that I have seen on the system. So you can kind of see that the, the uh, page um, compact isolated is, it is the range versus how many page successes. And then, yeah, there are a few failures. Um, I'm comfortable with what I'm seeing, uh, considering I was running six kernels um, compiles at that time, running a cyclic deadline during uh, par in parallel. So that, that's the kind of number um, you should be seeing. You should be seeing a lot more uh, migrate successes than failures. Um, also look at sketch stats and do you see um, MCEs, a lot of uh, machine checks and interrupts impacting workload performance? Keep, keep an eye on that. That would be hardware part of it. Do you have to understand? Um, pressure, CPU pressure stats, also look at CPU IO while you are running the workload and before, of course, and then after stopping. Um, Align with align that with your workload resource usage. Does it that is that is in is it in line with the workload um, resource usage uh, you would expect? And then um, take to uh, pay attention to the severity coverage um, to see um, if you can tune any of the actions that need to be taken um, if the, when MCAs happen or any of the system severity uh, uh, conditions occur. Um, pay attention to deadline misses um, using deadline test. Look at, uh, 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 is your workload missing too many deadlines? Tune the hardware based on um, suggested vendor suggestions, hardware and firmware um, to see 
look for any suggestions they might make um, to be able to use in a RT uh, for a best RT performance, whatever that means for that workload, whatever that means for that hardware and uh, firmware. And mm, I think Ilana talked about this a little bit, um, doing power, man power man management, turning off power management NMIs that always need to be looked at in conjunction with workload um, as well as the platform, um, firmware, all of those things into consideration. Adjusting P states, all of these again, you need to uh, look at the overall system um, holistically, including the uh, workload running um, based on the expectations from your workload. Um, that is primarily my core of the presentation in terms of um, what uh, uh, what I'm what are the recommendations to system integrators um, at, to, to be able to gather is so my where I'm coming from my assumption is that system integrators will know their platform um, hardware and firmware and they will know about their workload. Um, they're familiar with the workload. The part that they are not familiar is the kernel part, what they can look at, um, what kind of information can they look at from the kernel individual um, if they want to say, hey, is my workload, for example, um, missing any deadlines? Or uh, they can gather that after running the workload, but some of the stats, where can they get the stats to gauge uh, the kernel, how the kernel is uh, working together with their workload. So that is uh, the primary objective. So a couple of tips I'm leaving for the Linux, uh, scheduling part of it. Um, this, is, this is general philosophy of Linux scheduling. Most, most everybody in the audience would know this, I think, um, that uh, we RT throttling kicks in when RT ta tasks, so 95% by default is uh, allocated. Um, if it exceeds, uh, throttling uh, could, um, could kick in. And the premise being that a well-behaved workload doesn't exceed 90% of the CPU time. So, um, and then, uh, and then I'm just leaving a couple of tips on um, what kind of deadline scheduler, what do differences between different uh, scheduling uh, philosophies and schedulers that if you maybe if your RT workload, you want to focus on deadline type uh, scheduling as opposed to um, normal POSIX real time classes, then you want to go with the deadline scheduler to play with on your system on, on the kernel. I also played with a little bit with the two uh, deadline scheduling server uh, works that is happening, the patch that that's uh, in in, pro in progress. And then and I uh, jotted down some information on what the work that's happening. And then um, I think Daniel is uh, doing this work in terms of delaying enabling deadlines on work, uh, control the enabling enablement using watchdog timer. I played with it a little bit. I, I plan to continue to play with that so, to see if I can develop any guidelines and then also um, uh, look for any information. I can, sh um, I can ask, I, we can um, ask the system integrators to look at. So what would be a good one to look at? What would be, I'm kind of following this uh, work that's happening. And I think that is the end of my slides. And I have, um, I think we are going to develop, these are the references I have um, looked at and um, some of the, for the work I have done and figuring out what to gather, what kind of um, information to gather from the system and so on. So um, I would, it would be great if you can give me feedback on this and if you can suggest any other ways to maybe gather information on the system um, for system integrators so that, that they can go and understand their system, any other stats that would be relevant uh, to look at when they are tuning their workload or just understanding the workload. 
how their workload is working together with their platform and uh, the preemptivity karma. Thank you very much. Other questions from the room? I'll pass the uh, microphone. Hi, Shua. This is uh, Tim Bird. Hey, um, some of the st one of the stats you had, I'm a little confused on. Proc key mm -hmm. users, I hadn't seen that before. Uh, is that related to real time? Uh, like um, so the proc, proc key users tells you the user groups or users that might be taking up um, who is running really uh, the users that are running. So my uh, thinking is that it will tell us if you have if you sorry let me go back to that um, place that I am on. Um, my idea is that if you were to look at um, that stat. It could tell you if you have an RT, if, if you on, on your system, your workload has different user groups and you have set your RT groups, RT users and then non-RT users, then you can tell, um, looking at it, you can tell if um, um, the staff is in line with what you were expecting. Okay, I, I, I guess the man page is off there because it, it appears to be related to uh, users who have items in the kernel's key rings. It's, it appears to be a cryptography related thing. Okay, let me, when I looked at the stat, yeah, last time I was, thought that could be useful. Um, yeah, it, it gives you information on, uh, on my system it tells you based on user groups. That's what, that's the information that tells me. Is the man page off a little? Okay. Oh, hello. I can add. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, a question related to the RT throttling. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. is there is no uh, recommendation to put there a minus one? and to ah. disable all the other RT uh, while there is no, to solve it ah. uh, under the design, under a good design, a good real-time design. Uh -huh. You didn't just suggest to put there minus one, right? No. Should I be doing, doing that? Uh, think if you want, you don't want to if you just want the real time task to ah to be ah, scheduled right, right 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 i have a, I um i didn't do that i wanted to um it, so yeah i d didn't want to just run uh, real time tasks i am assuming that the workload might have a mix would that be a right assumption to make? Yeah, but I think still, if you're running also non-RT and RT and put the minus one, uh, maybe mm -hmm. in good design, good real-time design, you have time for those uh, non-RT tasks. Mm. Okay, I, I, will, I will recommend that. I'll add that okay. recommendation. Thank you. So the RT throttling is more as safe to measure than, uh, than mm -hmm. something that you use to, to tune your system, even with the, the, the OWL server, right? That's, the, the fact is that Linux cannot run 100% of the time on real-time tasks because there is eventually right. a key worker that will jump on that CPU, and if you stall it, you can put your system down. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> disabling real-time throttling Actually, in a safety system, if you hit the conditions for, uh, any, for running throttling, it's probably your workload that's broken. And you should check that. Sir? Right, right. Yeah, or that is, that, if that didn't come across, that's my intent, that they need, they need to check that if you are getting close to the um, throttling, if they are in. So I will add that. Is that, that didn't come across, I think, right, in my slide set? So I can add that. 
Is that is that what you're saying? That I should call that out. That if your workload is you, if you, you're reaching throttling, that means there's something wrong with the RT workload. Yeah, probably. It, it, you yeah. need to give some space for for eventual work that we work on the CPU, like key workers. It's we, we still don't have like right. a full isolation support. But there's a question. Okay, sounds good. I I will call that out. Saying that, um, a, no, the question more a comment about RT throttling. It depends uh, really mm -hmm. on your workload. If you do something periodic, like uh, for example, you do automatic uh, uh, lighting control on your uh, video stream or control uh, injector uh, in uh, auto engine or something like this, if you do even minimal real time throttling, uh, you will break your workload. But uh, if you do have uh, periods where uh, you don't care about real time, maybe it will work. But again, uh, I don't know. Uh, we do a system where we control a camera for every frame. We try to put uh, some 5 two, or 2% two of uh, non-real time. Uh, it just breaks uh, all the system. Mm. So it's it's a it's a work. Um, um, what I'm hearing is the, uh, that that uh, um, is workload dependent. So that's kind of what I'm saying that you have to understand the workload. You have to tune the system for the workload. Shura and Yelana, other questions on Zoom? I don't see anything in the chat, man. Okay, there's one more question in the audience here. Absolutely, great, thank you. I am Pavel Machek from Dengs, and I would like to ask, do you have some kind of guidelines where Linux should not be used? Like, uh, who is not comfortable with seeing Linux in their breaks? I am not. Uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't focused on that. I'm, uh, I am looking at, um, that is a good question um, to say where it should be used also. Uh, I'm not even, we are not making recommendation on where it should be used either um, or where it should not be used either. Uh, we are assuming that that is a decision that is made by the uh, people that are interested in using it. And for people that are interested in using it, um, we are providing guidelines on um, what, uh, how best they can analyze their workloads and on their platforms with the preempt RT. Any, uh, Ilana, do you, would you like to address that? Um, in a, um, uh, act, is there any more you wanna add to that? Um, no, I would be very, very hesitant to make any recommendations. I do believe that um, we're only at the beginning of an investigation and um, I'm always optimistic because we are seeing Linux being used in many more areas where than in the past. Um, but I think we're still seeing non-Linux RTOS, non-Linux more proprietary, you know, classical, that's cool, RTOS is being used in control systems, in, 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 very um, um, areas where there's very specific, very strong safety requirements, based mainly because of safety standards, which uh, need to be dealt with. But as I said, and as Shua also said, we cannot um, make specific recommendations. We can only try to broaden the usage and um, perhaps even broaden the the awareness and the even um, the acceptance by testing and 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 additional features of RT Linux to see it being used in in more and more areas, but I don't think at this point anybody can really make any more specific recommendations than that. Uh, so this is Tim again. I I just like to make an observation. There are I, I this last year I've been looking at the space industry. And some of the standards they have uh, are not exactly standards around things like, specific things like real time, but they have process standards that Linux cannot possibly meet, right? Like the number, of, the, the process for adding code to the kernel 
uh, is just way too open compared to some of the process standards they have, at least in the space industry. I don't know about other industries. Uh, and so that's a problem for us. Um, but my overall impression is technically, you can get Linux to do what needs to be done, but it's quite a bit more complicated than with an RTOS. With an RTOS, you don't have like all these extra layers. You don't have like, you know, a, a bunch of config knobs you have to turn or to tune. You have to understand the system just as well, but, but there is a challenge. There's a perception uh, from other industries that the RTOSs are just simpler to, to validate. Uh, that, and, and that's, uh, I think, again, technically Linux can do the job, but, uh, but it's more complicated. At least that's the impression that people have. Right. I don't know one is uh, more complicated than the other. Um, it, uh, being open comes with uh, its uh, benefits that um, there is no more, more of a knowledge base to tell you um, what can be looked at and what uh, you can benefit from. And like you're saying, there is a perception, you're right. Um, in your opinion, is that per perception incorrect? Yes, I, I, I am glad to hear that. The, the, uh, glad to hear that per perception is incorrect. Um, I think sometimes um, uh, people shy away from. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess you heard me, even though I didn't have the mic, which is good. Yes. But, yeah, the perception is incorrect. I, uh, but, you know, things like uh, in in the space industry, they're using hardened radiation hardened processors that are running like two hundred and fifty uh, kilohertz, right? And, and, and it blows their mind when they get on a, uh, something that's running gigahertz. Uh, and they have so much spare processing power that they really don't even know what to do with it. They can hit all their real-time deadlines, no sweat, uh, even, mm -hmm. only use, even only dedicating 50% you know, of the CPU. Uh, but it's a total mind shift for them. Uh, so mm -hmm. anyway. Absolutely, I'm with you. Um, I mean, I have I have been in uh, industries where um, in the past when I did um, RT work um, on proprietary operating systems, you had verticals. Um, the entire vertical was controlled by one person, one uh, entity. So uh, there is that con aspect of being able to control the entire uh, vertical that probably is a comfort factor as well. But uh, thank you, Tim. That's great. Any other questions? I mean, um, uh, let I, me let me answer I, on that can one. I, can oh. I? Let me answer on that one uh, uh, some more. Mm -hmm. So it, it massively depends what you want to do. I mean, mm -hmm. if your job Absolutely. is just uh, blinking a LED every five minutes, you don't need a 64-bit CPU with a gigahertz. It's a microcontroller. It's good enough. So anyone with a sane mind would choose a microcontroller. I mean, there are enough insane people out in the world. So some people use 64-bit machines to flip a bit. Uh, but mm -hmm. no, seriously, if you, if you go, whatever it is, real-time system safety, whatever you do, you look at what's the workload I'm, mm, I need to get done, and then you choose your components. Mm -hmm. So that Absolutely. explains, and because a lot of you look in your car, I mean your brake controller, you, why would I put a 64-bit CPU into that thing? Because it's cheaper. Yeah, it's cheaper, but it's... No, it's not cheaper, because the in, you have to, you have to um, look at both, the production cost and the engineering costs. If your engineering costs are so high that you can't save money, then nobody with a sane mind will go there. I mean, if you have high, high quantities um, and you can spare five cents on production costs, but then this is going to be a lot of money for engineering, but is it enough? And what's the risk you're taking with that? I mean, that pulls into the money side as well because your insurance fees will go up into astronomic heights. Um, so there's seriously uh, for, for safety, critical things, and 
also for 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 uh, real time operations where you where you don't uh, need have the uh, extended safety aspects. You really look at it. What do I need, and what what's my engineering effort to get it actually done? But why are are people looking into into preempt or T for safety critical systems because they want to do insane things on safety critical. Uh, uh, environments like autonomous driving with 500 sensors and cameras and whatever the hell and you can't freaking do it with a 16-bit microcontroller for which you get all the nice things including pre-certified operating systems and whatever. But even, even for that case, if you get the pre-certified OS from whatever, the small RTOS vendors for your safety critical system, then you integrate it still into your product and you add your mm -hmm. application on top and you are going to do this overall safety assessment. That port underneath you get from your OS vendor is just very built up upon, but that's, that's it. It's not guaranteeing that just because you use it, your system will be safe. And right. that's where we really have, how we really have to look at it. But coming back to, to, to um, Tim, there are enough RT systems up in space. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there's more Linux in space than there are RT systems. <laughs> that's true, too. But I know at least, a, at least a large amount of RT systems flying around up there. And it frightens the hell out of me. <laughs> But ju just adding on top of that, uh, when, when we think on safety critical system, we are always, or many times, you are trying to think on the most most critical component of my car, like the ABS, for example. But I don't think that people in the automotive are targeting for those components. They are targeted for, like Thomas said, for the autonomous driving on, or on the top layer really of, of safety. They have other mechanisms to, to back them up, and they are targeting a uh, a lower level of safety. For example, it's not AZUD for automotive, but AZUB. Things that Linux can achieve with some work, so some realistic. So that's that's we cannot try to focus on think, okay, Linux will never work on the ABS of my car. Okay, that's not what most of the people are trying there. They are not trying AZUD. People know that they won't achieve. But a lower level of safety like AZUB, where I can uh, can have uh, some backup system to back me up, but still I can use Linux with all this new cool stuff. So when, they, when people think on Linux, on automotive, for safety critical, they are almost never thinking on the components that already exist. They are building a platform for the, the new components that will come, that some companies are bringing to the cars, but th th things 10 to 15 years ahead. And that's why they are interested in Linux, and th that's why there is such an effort. And most of this after 40 is, is being backed by companies that have an idea and have a need for Linux. So that, that's what based their, their reasoning and their effort. It, it's not for, for, for the space, but it's for a, a big pile of software stack that will drive us around. Yelana, you have your hand up on Zoom. You have something to add? Ah, yeah. Anyway, uh, actually, I want to thank Thomas and Daniel for pretty much saying what I was going to say, that uh, the world is not black and white, and there are definitely certain areas where we won't have, we will have to focus on those, you know, let's call them legacy and standard RTOSs, which give um, those high uh, qualification standards and whatever. But for the very, very tremendous range of applications in which Linux is being used. Um, I think, you know, Thomas and, and Daniel actually expressed it very, very well. And that's where I'm trying to foster this interest to see um, how we can expand that use and, and, and expand that awareness and, and, and see which features are most relevant and, and, and grow on that, okay? And I think that's also why we are involved also in, in Friday's um, Safety Critical Software Summit. And I will be in Prague from Wednesday, and I'll be very happy to follow up with anybody on these discussions because of the, the great need for Linux in the, in the many, many areas of the software stack, which are not as uh, 
highly safety critical, but definitely are still um, related to both safety and um, real-time requirements to see how we align and, and move ahead from there. Okay, so thank you, Thomas and Daniel, and, um, and I hope we can continue this um, communication and conversation and, and the work with SUA and, and to grow together and see more usage. Just, just Thank you, everybody. This is great just, feedback. And then uh, we are presenting, Ilana and I are presenting uh, this talk, um, the Critical Software Summit on uh, uh, Friday, June 30th. Um, and then we will take all this feedback that you have given us and fold that into our uh, just, uh, just, the talk when we uh, just, present just this. One, Sorry. Just one last uh, technical feedback. So ma okay. many of the options that I that I saw there, like mem compaction mm -hmm. and, and those things, we have disabled already on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux for real time. And uh, I think that you all can use the config option from the, the Red Hat for real time as a, a solid starting point for the kernel configuration because we have been tuning that configuration for for more than a decade now. Ah, and, and there good is, to know. And there is also a tool that is Tundi that has uh, profiles that you can, that it automatically set your system with well-known uh, knobs, for example, for low latency, for network. And, and there is one, uh, one option, which is real time. And on that profile, they are already enabled all the basic stuff like setting up the, the, the performance governor, uh, re removing the exit from idle latency, and all, all those or many of the debugs that are, are just um, e e easy to pick. So these two things, the kernel config file from Red Hat and the tune D profile for real time, they, they, can, they can speed up your process because they are, de they, they are fixing all the basic stuff. And so uh, RHRT config and then profiles, that's the one that you, uh, you're saying take a look at all. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I'll talk to you offline, uh, Daniel, yeah. to get um, any um, specific, uh, you know, documents or I, uh, you, um, links. Uh, I do. I did refer to one um, uh, RT, uh, Red Hat um, document that goes over um, RT, and uh, um, I'll, I'll connect with you offline. Get to get yeah, this sure. information. Thank Anytime. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Okay.